Hi everybody, um, thanks for tuning in. In this lecture, we are going to kind of introduce the topic of exercise and sport physiology and try to figure out a way that we can then use this information to apply it to improve our um, practices as coaches in the athletic realm. So to kind of kick things off, um, again, just want to give us some kind of general definitions of um, physiology and exercise physiology. And let's see, I want to use my little marker here. Um, so when we think about physiology, we are understanding how the body works. Okay, so again, when we think about human physiology, the concepts there are understanding the different systems within the body and how the different organs are going to work together and interact in order to complete whatever their tasks are. Okay. Now exercise physiology then adds another layer to this. So with exercise physiology, we're interested in understanding how does the body work as it relates to exercise and really kind of two different branches that we want to take a look at when we think about exercise physiology, we're going to focus on acute and chronic exercise. Okay, so acute exercise, we're looking at what happens during one singular exercise bout. So for example, if I go outside and I go for a run, what are some of the changes that happen within my body during that singular run? So for example, my heart rate's gonna increase, I'm going to start sweating more, I'm going to increase my breathing frequency, I'm in going to increase blood flow to my muscles, I'm going to increase uh, metabolic activity in those muscles. Um, I'm going to have some feel good hormones kind of release that are going to make me feel good about um, doing that particular singular exercise bout. Those are some examples of what's happening in an acute exercise bout. Now, when we think about chronic exercise um, from an exercise physiology perspective, we're interested in how does the body change or adapt as it relates to regular exercise. Okay, so for example, instead of now thinking about me going out for one singular run, we're interested in understanding what happens to my body to improve efficiency if I go for a run five days a week, every week for the next um, six to eight weeks or something along those lines. What are some things that are going to be different about my body after that versus what my body looked like maybe before I started training? Okay, so examples of chronic changes that we might see um, with athletes include um, a decrease in body composition. We can increase uh, muscle mass and <clears throat> neuromuscular integration, which means the the coordination between the nervous system and the muscles will improve. Um, maybe we see an increase in mitochondrial density, which is like this little thing inside the cell that's going to help us to do aerobic work. Um, so these are just a few examples of uh, chronic changes that can occur with regular exercise. Okay. Um, also within the realm of exercise physiology, we want to understand what's happening from an environmental perspective. So for example, how are we affected by hot environments and humidity? Um, and how does that impact our ability to complete that exercise bout or impact our exercise capacity? Okay. And then we also want to understand what's happening from a physiological perspective with special populations. So for example, if I'm working with young kids versus an older athlete, um, what are some differences that I need to kind of be aware of in terms of how they're going to react and respond to particular exercise uh, stimuli? So those are just some examples, again, certainly not an all-inclusive list that kind of helps us to um, understand or begin to understand the difference between acute and chronic exercise and kind of what we're going to be talking about throughout this class is kind of how we can apply this information to these different populations, whether I'm working with young athletes, adolescents, um, or an older, more mature population, how are these things going to vary or differ? Oh, so here you go. The physiology is the study of the function of the cells, tissues, and organ systems. And then, as we said, exercise physiology can be either acute or chronic. Um, and we talked about kind of some of those aspects as well. Okay, um, so this I just thought was really interesting. I, I won't focus a whole lot on this information, but um, just kind of wanted to touch base in terms of where we came from in the world of exercise physiology and kind of where we're heading and how this might help us to gain an understanding of why it is we do what we do 
in the world of sport and kind of how this has helped us. Okay. So again, um, when we think about exercise physiology, again, it, it, it's a, it's a science heavy field, right? So again, um, this is a branch of science that has allowed us to understand how to improve our training mechanisms. So, um, how do we know how to improve muscular strength? How do we know how to improve anaerobic capacity, um, and those types of things. And again, um, if you pay any attention to any professional sports, um, I'm a big track and field person. And so, um, I'm recording this in the summer and, um, the Olympic trials are going on right now. It's been amazing to see how many, um, meet records and American records and even world records, um, we're seeing in this kind of Olympic cycle. And again, part of that has to do with a lot of the groundwork that's been done as it relates to the research so that we know how to train these athletes to the best of our ability. So we're improving in our efficiency of how to train athletes. And this is kind of where we started with. Okay. So again, um, when we, when we look at what kind of kicked us off, um, 1913, we're starting to understand something known as cardiorespiratory control. When we think about cardiorespiratory control, basically what they were doing in their lab in Denmark is trying to understand that, okay, well, when I do hard things, I seem to breathe heavier and also my heart rate's up. So there's something going on there. So they started to understand that there's this linear relationship between increased heart rate and increased work. Um, and some of those type, types of factors. Um, 1920, again, also happening in Denmark. So we had a lot of ground um, groundwork kind of done in that particular area. Um, but they started to understand capillary blood flow to skeletal muscle. So um, basically what that means is when I start to do exercise. So for example, if I was going to ride my bike, which is going to be a really lower body intensive exercise, I'm going to increase blood flow to the muscles that are being utilized. And so they were able to kind of figure that out with these capillaries. So capillaries are like a little small vessel and we were able to see an increase in blood flow um, in those capillaries that led to the muscles that were activated. Then let's head over to England and Germany um, where we're looking at um, exercise physiology related research here. Um, again, a lot of this kind of this groundwork was really done on aerobic exercise. Um, and again, maybe the reason for that is the uh, acute changes that we see in aerobic exercise, such as increased heart rate and respiration, are pretty visibly noticeable. So that's kind of where we started with that which is kind of cool. Um, Harvard Fatigue Lab um, in the United States, they did a lot of work um, looking at soldiers. So they wanted to help our soldiers to train to become more efficient. Again, look at the time frame going on here. Um, so we were able to really focus in on what we can do um, for our military in order to improve their performance. Um, the Harvard Fatigue Lab also did some kind of some, um, I would say, groundwork for um, the scientific method method in terms of what we consider gold standards in terms of our exercise testing. And we'll talk more about that later in this course. Um, okay, so again, we can see physiology happening, kind of popping up all over the place. So we've got Denmark, Sweden, um, physical fitness research. So again, um, if you remember back to um, your time in like middle school, for example, we have like the physical fitness testing and things like that. That's what we're talking about here. So again, um, you either do like a 12 minute run or a one mile run or um, the number of pushups you can do, um, et cetera. Those, those uh, presidential fitness tests, that's kind of where this came from. Um, and again, now we're starting to get into not until the 1940s, 1950s, are we starting to look at resistance training and kind of look um, into what's happening there? Again, I would say Honestly, the aerobic stuff came first and then resistance training is a little bit behind um, where we are that way in terms of kind of the progression of the research there. Okay, moving forward from the 1950s to 2000s, um, 1954 ACSM or the American College of Sports Medicine was founded um, and this is a huge part of our field. I would say this is kind of like the governing body for um, the field of kinesiology and exercise physiology. Um, so that kind of serves as our governing body. Um, we're looking at environmental research. So here you can see like a little um, sauna. So we're looking at, you know, how does the body's physiological function change when we give it a heat stimuli. Um, then we're moving into this biochemistry and molecular biology research. 
And with those, we're looking at what's happening at the cellular level in terms of chronic change and even acute change during um, aerobic exercise, again, as, as I mentioned previously. But um, so I, I already mentioned this, but there's like these little things called mitochondria within our cells. And so Booth was very... Um, important in kind of establishing like what does that do from a metabolic perspective and like why is that important to us both in an acute manner and like when we chronically change when we chronically train how are we changed that way And then from 2001 to present, um, what's been happening here? So now we're looking at also really a, a lot of a lot of different things going on here. Um, but here we're starting to look at genetics as well. So the first studies in genetic selection. So kind of understanding how do genetics play a role in athletic performance? Um, when we think about exercise physiology in kind of a more broad sense, um, we're not as interested in sport performance. We're more interested in disease and disease prevention. So again, we've got a lot of that going on now. Um, again, if you're familiar with anything related to like disease, we've linked a couple different genetic traits to like your risk of breast cancer, for example. So there's a BRCA1 and a BRCA2 gene that we can actually screen you for to determine your risk for developing breast cancer. Um, the BRCA1 gene is like an early onset of breast cancer. And then the BRCA2 gene um, is something that you would like develop later in life. But really, really interesting to kind of take a look at what's happening from a genetic perspective and how we can link that to disease. But as it relates to what we do in the world of coaching, really, really interesting when we think about you know, how our athletes are going to be different in terms of their kind of their top end, they're reaching their true potential. A lot of that has to do with um, what's happening from a genetic perspective. Um, what else is interesting here? Um, so again, kind of understanding what's happening from an endocrine perspective. So again, hormones are super important in exercise performance. And I would say that's um, more of a big deal in the resistance training world than it is in the aerobic world, but kind of understanding that how important Important that is and um, you know how we can kind of monitor that and kind of understand what's happening from an endocrinology perspective in terms of setting us up for success in athletics. So here you can see kind of the growth of scientific publications that we've seen within the um, world of exercise physiology from 1950s to 2019 and again we're seeing really a large amount of growth in this particular area as we start to increase education and increase you know the the importance of this um for not only for sports and for coaches but also um kind of as we mentioned in the previous slide when we think about the role that exercise can play in disease prevention but also in treatment of diseases so i'm um, seeing a lot more going on here So what does this look like when we think about exercise physiology research and kind of understanding kind of how this works? Um, what do we need to know? Um, so first thing to kind of take note of is the scientific method. And the scientific method is a systematic approach used by researchers to address scientific questions. So I would say the most important thing when we think about the scientific method is kind of using this, this logic in order for us to determine best case practices for us as coaches. Um, so for example, we can't just say, well, I use the foam roller and it feels really great when I use the foam roller, so I'm going to have all my athletes use it. If we really want to know if this is effective or not, we need to do actual scientific research in order for us to understand, is this physiologically effective or not? Um, so there's several different types of, of research design. Um, research strategies will often fall into kind of two different categories. We can have field and laboratory research, and this is research that can be performed in several venues. And I'll kind of give you some examples um, of each of these here in just a second. And then we have basic and applied research. And this is race, research that can be categorized based on the goals of the investigation. Um, so again, when we think about field versus field work versus laboratory work. So for example, if I wanted to understand, um, let's say, 
something within running performance, right? I can have subjects come in and do a VO2 max test on a treadmill in a controlled environment, and that's example of laboratory research. Or I could go to a 5K race and be able to kind of collect data in the field there. And again, there's there's pros and cons of doing it both way. If I go into the field, um, we're in a real life scenario where we can collect data on actual performance versus laboratory um, research where we're trying to mimic what a performance might be like. And again, that's a little bit difficult because running on a treadmill versus running in a race are significantly different in terms of what's happening from a psychological perspective. So we kind of have to keep those things in mind um, when we think about you know what makes the most sense um, for this. But at the end of the day, what we want to know as coaches is how can I apply this research to what I do and how I design workouts for my athletes and you know how how do I use that to kind of guide the boat in terms of what am I having them do and why because the other part is when we think about science it's it's not enough for me to know that I have to be able to sell that to my athletes as well and I think that education piece is really important when we think about um, having validity with our athletes and kind of having that expertise. It's really important that we're able to kind of understand this and explain this to them. So we're using these workouts and here's why and here's what the science shows. So being able to kind of educate our athletes on that um, gives us a lot of um, a lot more credibility, I think, um, depending on kind of what level you're working at. So again, what does the scientific method look like? Um, so this kind of takes you through these various steps. So number one, we have a research question. Number two, we are going to form a hypothesis. Number three, we're going to design an experiment to test the hypotheses. We'll collect data and analyze that data. Then we're going to interpret the data and formulate uh, conclusions and then communicate the results. So, for example, um, I'm working on a research project now where I'm looking at grit, which is um, one's perseverance and passion towards achieving a goal. So people that have a high amount of grit are um, willing to stick with whatever their goal is, even when the going gets tough. Okay, so again, um, one thing that I'm looking at is the grit of individual athletes um, over their college career. So I want to understand if grit scores as a freshman in college will predict whether or not they stay out for that sport by the time they're seniors. Um, we're also looking at other variables such as are they male, are they female, are they on an individual sport, are they on a team sport, what's kind of the, the team success of the team that they've been a part of, how many athletes are on that team. So we're looking at all these different variables here. My research question is can grit predict whether or not an individual stays out for that sport for all four years, okay? So my hypothesis or my educated guess is that people that have a higher grit score or have more grit are more likely to stay in that sport for four years. They're more likely to retain for us, okay? So I've designed my experiment to test this hypothesis. So over the past four years, I've collected data on grit of all the Loris College athletes in all the sports. Okay, so again, I'm looking to see those athletes, are they, when they come in as freshmen, are they still out for the team when they're seniors um, is kind of what we're looking at. So again, um, we can have independent and dependent variables. So the independent variable is the controlled variable and the dependent variable is the measured variable. Okay, so the controlled variable for me is what sport and what year are you? And then the dependent variable is their grit score. Okay, so that's what we want to measure. And then we're going to use that information to understand whether or not they stay out for the sport. Collect and analyze the data. In this particular example, um, the data is being collected every single year over the course of eight years. We're going to collect the data and then we will interpret that data and come to conclusions. Um, that could be that maybe women have higher grit scores than men or vice versa. Maybe those in individual sports are going to have higher grit um, than people on a team sport like football, for example. Um, you know, so so kind of uh, understanding that information and then what do we do with that? OK, so communicate those results and how can we use that to help us? So um, one thing that I think could be helpful for us as a small institution, uh, Division three school is kind of understanding what role does that play 
and retention in sport and how does that impact how I recruit particular types of people, okay? Um, and then I think the next step when we communicate those results is figuring out, okay, what can I do next to push this forward, right? So if we find that grit is an important predictor of whether or not I'm retained in sport, my next question is, what can I do as a coach to increase grit levels in my athletes? Okay, so again, kind of understanding what's the next step um, in terms of pushing this topic forward if it is found to be significant, or if it's not, you know, what are some good predictors of whether or not an athlete will stay out for sports? Maybe there's some other variables that we need to take a look at. Okay, so here we can look at um, classes of research design. Um, we've got several different types of, of studies here. So we can do a non-experimental research. We can have um, some examples of this as descriptive, stu descriptive studies. So this is maybe like understanding groups of people. Um, for example, what are the qualities that are shared in elite football players um, that differ from the average population? Okay, so again, maybe we're looking at this from a genetic perspective to kind of understand, um, you know, what is it that this group of people has that the average population doesn't have? Okay, case studies, um, this was my example with the foam roller. So um, I used a foam roller and I had great success with um, improving IT band syndrome or something along those lines. So again, how is this particular um, mode or this particular intervention helped the singular athlete? Okay, so that's an example of a case study where I'm looking at just one um, individual athlete. Okay. Uh, correlational studies. So again, here we're looking at the relationship between two variables. So an example of a correlational study, um, the number of miles run per week, does that um, relate to or correlate to their performance in distance running? So for example, um, the more miles I run, the faster I can run a 5k or something along those lines. And then we can also do what's called experimental research. And in experimental research, we're going to have an independent variable and a dependent variable. And I kind of already mentioned this on the previous slide, but the independent variable is a controlled variable. Um, so again, that's what we are um, that's what we are kind of monitoring or kind of controlling for um, as the researcher. And the dependent variable is the measured variable. So for example, um, let's say I wanted to look at a study where I wanted to see if foam rolling improved um, squat performance or something along those lines. Okay, so independent variable, what am I controlling? I'm controlling whether or not the athlete uses a foam roller or not. Okay, so foam rolling versus not foam rolling. And then my dependent variable is the measured variable. Maybe we want to look at 1RM on the squat. Okay, so again, understanding um, what is that number, that's what we're going to measure is how much they can squat. And we're going to look at that in two different types of lenses, one with the foam rolling and one without foam rolling. So again, that's an example of both independent and dependent variables. Okay, um, again, I kind of mentioned this already, but looking at the difference between laboratory and field research. So um, laboratory research, again, we're going to have great internal validity with this, and that means that we know what happens is due to the change that we've induced. So again, um, this is great for internal validity because, um, again, we have a lot of control when we do things in a lab. We can control the environment. We can control the speed of the treadmill. Um, we can control, you know, the temperature in there. So again, we can control a lot of variables um, kind of within that experiment, and it creates more of a rigid environment for our subjects. Um, so again, control of those external conditions, like I mentioned, whether that be temperature um, or, you know, something along those lines, speed, if we're on a treadmill or something like that. Okay, field research, again, this would be going out and going into um, a real life competition scenario. Okay, advantages here, we're going to collect data, like we said, in a real world environment. So again, if I'm interested in running performance, maybe I go to a 5K race and I'm able to um, measure some sort of variable there versus um, in a lab setting, I'd have somebody kind of run on a treadmill. Okay. 
So again, basic versus applied research. Basic research, is there a link between protein intake and strength gains? And then when we think about applied research, how do we take that information and develop recommendations for the average population based on this evidence-based practice? Okay, so how can we apply that research to our jobs as coaches? So for example, um, that basic research might be something along the lines of where I have a group of athletes and I am giving half of them a high protein diet and half of them kind of a low protein diet. And then we're tracking their strength gains over a six month period or something along those lines. Um, and again, what we want to do as coaches, like, again, most of us are not necessarily interested in doing basic research. We're interested in the next part of that equation, which is that application. So how do we take this information from the study that is done and allow us to use that, um, to provide recommendations for our athletes, right? So again, if I can take this information from that basic research and say, hey, high protein diet is going to help us to gain more strength, then that's that application piece, okay? So again, being able to understand the research is probably more important for us than actually being able to complete the research um, as coaches, okay? Kind of already talked about this, but again, when we think about applied research, we're trying to understand studies that are designed to solve practical problems. For example, um, using that evidence-based practice to create um, recommendations for the average population or for the population that we're most interested in. Okay. So again, as I said, you know, our, our jobs as coaches, we're not super concerned with completing research. We're more interested in understanding um, how to digest this information and then utilize it to help us become better coaches, right? So reading and understand the literature. So scientific literature key points, um, again, number one, first and foremost, it's important that the research that we are reading or that research that we are kind of intaking and utilizing is peer reviewed. Okay. So again, we don't want to just Google this and find something on WebMD or, or whatever. The first thing that is that comes up livestrong.com or whatever, right? So again, we want to find, um, scholarly articles that are providing us with true, scientific knowledge. Okay, steps in peer review. So a little bit about this. Um, so number one, the research is going to be submitted to the journal for review. So for example, like most people that do research um, are professors and or they maybe work like at a research clinic or something along those lines. But in terms of like the type of research that we're interested in as coaches and things like that. Most of that is going to be done by like exercise physiologists, sports psychologists, whatever, that are professors at different institutions, higher education. Okay. So again, we do the research at that school and then we're going to submit that research project to a journal and that journal is going to review it. Okay. The article will be reviewed by two or more experts in the field. So for example, if you submitted an article about um, distance running and body composition or something like that, the journal will reach out to two people that are like considered experts um, in the, the realm of distance running and body composition or whatever. Okay, so again, at least two people will be reached out to to kind of review that. And again, the people that are reviewing that are also usually professors or work at the, um, like I said, like in a research clinic or something along those lines. Um, but that journal will kind of reach out based on what that topic is that was submitted. Okay. Then the journal edi editor will consider the reviewer's comments. So again, we'll take those experts' comments under, into consideration and then decide whether or not this should be published. Um, or not based on scientific flaws in the study. So again, um, as a reviewer, it's important that we have a critical eye in terms of kind of understanding, did they follow the rules of the scientific method and kind of upholding that? And then also like, is this valuable as a, an important element that we want to put out there as it relates to this topic? Is there missing information in this particular area? Okay. Um, some examples of high impact factor journals in exercise physiology research. So again, um, these are kind of some of those journals that would be kind of the top tier journals 
in terms of finding this information. Um, so Journal of Strength and Conditioning, Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise, I would say are the, the two most common uh, journals that I kind of use. Journal of Sport and Health Science is also nice. Um, International Journal of Sports Medicine maybe has some things related to rehab, um, some things related to training and that sort of stuff. So um, lots of great options here. Okay. Um, so again, searching for the scientific literature. So how do we do this? I would say the easiest thing, in my opinion, is to use Google Scholar. Um, but you can also use other search engines such as PubMed and Sport Discus. Sport Discus is nice because it is going to be really focused in on um, those journals that are going to be specific to coaching um, and that sort of, of information. Google Scholar and PubMed are going to be more general. So again, there will be all sorts of things that kind of come up in that search um, that might not necessarily come up when you do the sport discus search. Um, so it's really important that we choose the correct key terms um, when we define our searches. And so that way that's gonna help us to make sure that um, we're getting quality results back when we do those searches. And we'll do some of that within this class in terms of um, kind of finding some of the scientific literature. So components of a research report. So again, what are what are the things that we're going to be looking for or read? Um, so this is kind of how they're all organized. So number one, you're going to have the abstract. And the abstract is, think of this as just like a real short summary of what you're going to learn in that particular article. Okay, so the abstract will be just like one paragraph, and it'll give you a little bit of information about each of these different topics. Okay. Um, so let's run through kind of what this might look like. OK, so the abstract, again, like I said, a nice summary um, introduction. So the introduction is going to introduce the topic to you. Um, it's also going to explain to you why this research is important or pertinent. OK, so again, it's going to help us to understand why is this research important? And then also, how is this study going to be different than something you've already read? Right. So again, it's going to allow us to understand what is the gap in the literature and how is this article um, providing insight into that particular area? Okay. Um, so again, just then we move to the methods and the methods, they're going to introduce the subject population and how they did the experiment, right? So again, based on the methods, we should be able to um, do the experiment ourselves, essentially, right? So again, um, it tells you all the information about the subjects and all the information about how they did the data collection. Next, we'll go to the results. The results will give us information. Um, again, maybe sometimes they'll include what's called descriptive statistics here. And within that particular section, it'll tell us about those subjects. So again, um, maybe in the methods, they said they recruited 35 uh, college aged football players, right? In the results, it'll tell you, okay, the average age was 19.7 years old and their average body weight was XYZ and their average uh, body composition was XYZ and their average 1RM bench press was XYZ, right? So again, it'll give you that information. It also tells you um, the what they found in their study. So for example, if they were looking at, um, let's go with the protein and uh, 1RM, right? It'll tell you, okay, the average football player improved their strength in the 1RM squat by um, seven kilograms over the course of six months or whatever, right? So again, it'll give you all that information. It'll also do what's called statistical analysis. And statistical analysis allows us to understand whether or not those numbers are statistically different or not. OK, so again, um, with that statistical analysis, it's going to allow us to understand, does this is this make a difference? Is this like something that we should be doing or it wasn't enough? OK, um, then we move to the discussion and in, and in the discussion, we're going to um, try to make sense of those results. Right. So, again, um, explain why we found what we found. And then also the last part of that discussion will be what's the next step. So maybe it's how do I apply this information or what else should we be doing in research that will allow us to kind of fill in more of those holes um, within that particular topic um, as it relates to research. OK, and then the last section will be references and that'll be include a list of um, different areas that were kind of focused on um, or utilized as resources throughout the study.
Okay. So again, how do we evaluate a research report? So number one, was the research question important? So again, um, it's important for us to kind of understand, like, does this make a difference for us um, in terms of something that we can use in coaching and kind of apply? Number two, is the research study peer reviewed and published in a high impact factor journal? Again, I gave you a list of kind of some of those journals. So um, it's important for us to kind of understand like, OK, was this like is this like a legit study that was published somewhere legit? Um, our number three are the measures performed both valid and reliable. So, again, we think about validity and reliability. We're trying to understand does the test measure what it says it's going to measure? And then when we think about reliability, if you were to do the study and I was to do the study, would we get the same results, right? So we think about reliability, it's consistency over time in terms of finding those results. Uh, number four, and maybe the most important, was the study well designed, right? Did they think of all the important things that they needed to control for? Or, you know, for example, with that protein study, um, was there something that they missed, right? Did they um, just ask these subjects to kind of self-report the day after they ate? And so we're just kind of guessing, did they weigh out their food and give them their portions of their food um, and then control what they were eating outside of the study? So again, it's, it's really important for us to think critically and try to understand, was that study well designed? Um, and then, you know, that kind of gives us insight into whether or not there's a good application piece. And then number five, is the sample size sufficient to answer the question posed in the study? Again, if I did a study on 11 people for this protein strength gain study, I don't know if that's enough. Like, is that enough of a sample size for us to truly say that we need to switch all 112 of our football players into this high protein diet? I don't think so. Um, so again, kind of making those critical um you know, critical analysis types of decisions based on the information that you're learning, based on the information that you read. Okay. Um, other professional organizations within the world of exercise and sport physiology. Um, so the major two that I would mention um, are the American College of Sports Medicine or ACSM and then National Strength and Conditioning or NSCA. Um, so again, I would say those are kind of our two most important governing bodies in the world of sport physiology and sport science. Um, there's also a few others down here that you can note um, that are maybe more global. However, I would honestly say the American College of Sports Medicine is pretty darn global. Um, they have a national conference every year, and I feel like every year I'm meeting people from um, all over the world that have come to present their research or come to learn more about whatever their topic area of interest is. Okay. Um, certifications that are offered by professional organizations. So again, um, ACSM has several different um, certifications. So you can become a personal trainer. You can become a group exercise instructor or group exercise leader. You can become a clinical exercise physiologist or a certified exercise physiologist. Um, and again, each of those requires a standardized test that you have to take. There's different requirements that have to be met in order to do those things. So for example, the personal training and group exercise, like anybody can take those um, certification exams and become certified there. To be a certified exercise physiologist, you need a four-year degree in exercise science, kinesiology, something along those lines. And then for the clinical exercise physiologist, this is somebody that would work, for example, like in cardiac rehab um, is kind of the most common place for them to work. And they also need a four-year degree in something, and then they need a master's degree in exercise physiology in order to sit for their exam. And then they would work, like I said, um, in a clinical setting, maybe like working um, with cardiac rehab or something along those lines. And then um, NSCA or the um, National Strength and Conditioning Association has a what's called the CSCS or that's the Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist um, certification and that is kind of the gold standard in the weight room. Um, if you want to work in strength and conditioning, you've got to get your CSCS. Um, in order to get that, you need a four-year degree in exercise something along the lines of related career, and then you sit for an exam um, for that one as well. 
So what are some careers within the realm of exercise physiology? Um, so as I mentioned, cardiac rehab and kind of that clinical exercise physiology, um, we can do different things there and think about cardiac rehab as kind of a, um, a miniature version of personal training, essentially. So I'm helping somebody to return to their activities of daily living following a heart attack um, or something along those lines. Okay. Um, a clinical exercise physiologist might run stress testing, things like that, help with diagno diagnostic elements of cardiovascular disease, um, things like that. Strength and conditioning, again, um, working in a weight room or working with sports teams in terms of developing and implementing strength training and um, conditioning types of plans, agility, all that type of stuff. Uh, personal training, business owner, and then fitness facilities, owners, managers, um, like I said, uh, group fitness classes and that type of thing, um, group uh, personal training, all of that stuff is, um, you know, really popular um, within this field. So conclusions in the semester ahead. So again, um, really what we want to do, I'm super excited to um, teach this class and, and kind of um, share my knowledge about exercise physiology. That's my background. Um, so I'm super passionate about it. Um, but also um, how do we apply that and how do we tie that to coaching? So again, um, this I'm super pumped about because these are like my two passions. So exercise physiology, how does understanding how that body works, how can we apply that information to help us to become better coaches, right? And again, I think that those are um, going to go hand in hand when we um, think about exercise physiology from this sports lens. Okay, so our goal is to create adaptations in the body um, as a coach for better performance outcomes. And some of those Outcomes and some of those elements are going to be physiological in nature, right? So again, having good programming for my athletes, whether that's in the weight room or with my practices, um, is really, really important. However, I will be the first to tell you as a coach, you know, that's not the only thing, right? We have to also think about these other elements that are important. Um, genetics are important in determining our performance. Uh, family support, right? Um, our psychological aspects, right? So again, there's so many other layers to sport, por sport performance. This physiology is just one, um, one uh, layer of the onion, so to speak. So um, again, we do want to dive into this, but also appreciate that this is only one of those elements, right? So we'll be learning more about some of the other elements associated with sport performance, such as the psychological aspects, which I'll, I'll certainly um, talk about a little bit as well um, as we move through this course. And again, having a better understanding of how these things occur and what we can continue to do to increase performance through evidence-based practice is kind of what we're after in the field of sport physiology. So I hope you're excited. Um, I'm excited to take you on this journey and I hope you have a great day and reach out if you have any questions.